Throughout this presentation, you'll hear me use a combination of inclusive language, such as birthing people, people with the uterus, and chest feeding, and heteronormative language. Greetings. My name is Desiree Israel. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Maryland in Washington, D.C. I'm trained in perinatal mood and anxiety disorders as a reproductive psychotherapist, community herbalism, lactation, Lactation, supporting families in their choice to breast or chest feed, and birth work as a birth doula. A little more about me and my work. I'm a co-founder and practitioner at the Bloom Collective, where we support mamas, families, and birthing people along their pregnancy and postpartum journey with a supportive village. We offer services such as childbirth education, lactation support, therapy, herbal consultations, and support groups. I also co-founded the Perinatal Mental Health Alliance for People of Color, which is a program within Postpartum Support International. We are bridging the gap in perinatal mental health support services for Black, Indigenous birthing persons, providers, and communities of color. Our vision is to expand the access of perinatal mental health professionals of color for all families of color. One way we do this is by providing BIPOC providers with scholarships to attend PSI's two-day in-person or virtual training on perinatal mental health. Lastly, but not least, I have a private practice where I encompass all of this work with Black women and birthing people through their own life transitions into parenthood. Additionally, I assist organizations to incorporate anti-racist, anti-oppressive, and liberatory practices in their work. So I can't tell you what I do without sharing how I got here. This is me, Saturday, January 14th, 2012, 25 years old. Don't count my age, y'all. Fresh out of labor and delivery. Looking at this picture now, I can see not just the exhaustion, but the worry on my face. However, internally, I was excited. I had a pretty textbook pregnancy, but was not prepared for the crash of emotions I felt once I was allowed to take my first shower. A month and 12 days after giving birth, on February 26, 2012, a 17-year-old by the name of Trayvon Benjamin Martin was killed. It was then that I realized, after hearing more about his story and his killer, that I realized my son was also a target or could be seen as a threat the older he gets. The first year as a mother was brutal. Lack of familial support, raising my son away from my family, challenges with breastfeeding, emotional complications that I didn't realize until 2015 were postpartum depression and anxiety with a sprinkle of PTSD. I knew that there had to be other Black women and birthing people who looked like me that may have felt the same way at some point on their journey to parenthood. So I took my story and made sure that I could be or others would have access to what they needed during their transition into the greatest hood on the planet. So these photos highlight people, places, and events that have helped to mold my career. In the top right, these two beautiful rambunctious black boys, Rashid and Kingston, are my why. This picture, they're a little younger, but they're 10 and nine now. This bottom right picture, after learning about my undiagnosed postpartum depression at a training, I sought community within Postpartum Support International and co-founded the alliance with Jabina Coleman and Divya Kumar, who are both also social workers and lactation professionals. The three of us bring a varied experience, not only in our postpartum challenges, but culturally, as Jabina is Jamaican-American, Divya is of Southeast Asian descent, and I is a Black American who is also newly queer. Our shared cultural experience of the stigma of mental health in our communities was the catalyst and drive to our reasoning for founding the Alliance. In this top left picture, this led us to diversifying the membership of PSI's conference in 2018 in Houston, Texas, which was their most BIPOC attended conference in their history. In this bottom left corner picture is um, in 2018, a few colleagues and I founded the Bloom Collective. As of today, Tanaylin Harris, who's in the middle, is a postnatal doula, certified breastfeeding specialist and activist, and Stephanie Etienne is a certified nurse midwife and herbalist. And we continue to provide services to the greater Baltimore community through state-funded insurance, private pay, and equitable sliding scale. Lastly, this middle picture, I became a member of the National Perinatal Task Force, spearheaded by British trained midwife and one of Time's 2022 Women of the Year, Jenny Joseph. This is from our convening in Austin, Texas in 2019. 
This picture encompasses community midwives, public health leaders, and birth workers from across the United States. So there are so many ways I could take this presentation, but I'm going to keep it short and give a mini lesson on Roe v. Wade, reproductive justice, and maternal mortality, and your future in reproductive health. So on January 22, 1973, was a landmark decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in which the court ruled that the Constitution of the United States conferred the right to have an abortion. It provides a fundamental right to privacy, which protects a pregnant woman's right to an abortion. This caused an ongoing abortion debate in the United States about whether or to what extent abortion should be legal. Who should decide the, legal, the legality of abortion and what the role of moral and religious views in the political sphere should be. The case was brought by Norma McCorvey, known by the legal pseudonym Jane Roe, who in 1969 became pregnant with her third child. McCorvey wanted an abortion, but she lived in Texas where abortion was illegal, except when necessary to save the mother's life. South Africa legalized abortion in 1996 through the Choice and Termination of Pregnancy Act, which gives women, regardless of age or marital status, the right to access to abortion services within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. If she is between 13 and 20 weeks pregnant, the pregnancy may be terminated only under specific conditions. If she is more than 20 weeks pregnant, it will be done only if her or the fetus life is in danger or there are likely to be serious birth defects. Since 1996, there has been a significant decrease in morbidity for women in South Africa who have undergone unsafe abortion, especially younger women. But in reality, cultural and religious practices have resulted in unequal access to contraception and abortion. On Friday, June 24, 2022, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. The decision dismantled 50 years of legal protection and paved the way for individual states to curtail or outright ban abortion rights. This map from the Center for Reproductive Rights shows abortion bans, protections, and restrictions. Expanded access, which is in the light blue, means abortion remains legal and each state has their own set of laws, which protects reproductive and human rights. Protected in the yellow means abortion remains legal as long as the state's constitution is not amended and or these states have laws protecting these rights. Not, protect, not protected in the orange means abortion is accessible but without legal protection. Hostile, which is, a, is in the red, means abortion is illegal or has a trigger ban, for example, only having up until a certain amount of weeks before it is banned, or abortion is accessible without legal protection. And lastly, illegal in the burgundy means that there's a trigger ban to prohibit abortion entirely and criminalizes it. To put this in perspective, even if there's a medical necessity in states where abortion is hostile or illegal, Women and those with the uterus are not allowed to get an abortion, even if it means the pregnancy isn't viable and or it could kill them. Even further, I work a maternal mental health hotline and received a call from a woman in Texas who was pregnant and in an abusive marriage. Because she was married, she could not get, not only could she not get an abortion, she also could not file for divorce due to her pregnant status. So Roe v. Wade is definitely beyond abortion and could potentially have a global uh, impact globally, excuse me. The World Health Organization states that the lack of access to safe, timely, affordable, and respectful abortion care poses a risk to not only the physical, but also the mental, social well-being of women and girls, and as I say, anyone with the uterus. Pansy Katanga, in an article, stated that if the U.S. sneezes, the whole world gets a cold. The United States are now alongside Poland, El Salvador, and Nicaragua as the only nations to backtrack on or restrict abortion policies in decades. The ruling may fuel local anti-abortion movements, limit campaigns for abortion access, and complicate the politics around women's rights. Since the 1990s, about 60 countries have expanded laws or policies related to sexual and reproductive health and rights. 
In the past two years, South Korea has de decriminalized abortion, and several Latin American countries, Argentina, Mexico, and Colombia, have increased abortion access despite a long history of fierce religious opposition. With the U.S. advocating for gender equality, human rights, and healthcare equity, the decision to strike down Roe v. Wade is truly in contradiction to the values it is trying to advocate for abroad. This could have consequences globally, such as hurting local efforts around expanding sexual and reproductive health and rights, limiting funding, and exacerbating stigma. So maternal mortality in the United States. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention defines maternal mortality as the death of a woman during pregnancy at delivery or soon after the or soon after delivery, delivery, excuse me, usually within 42 days. Um, some states um, go up to one year postpartum. Sadly, about 700 women die each year in the United States as a result of pregnancy or delivery complications. Based on the most recent data from 2018, the maternal mortality rate in the U.S. is 17.4 deaths per 100,000 births. The United States is also the only developed country to see maternal mortality rates rising. The National Center for Health Statistics reported an 18.4% increase in U.S. maternal mortality, that is death during pregnancy or within 42 days of pregnancy between 2019 and 2020. The relative increase was 44.4% among Hispanic, 25.7% among non-Hispanic Black, and 6.1% among non-Hispanic white women. More women are having children later in life, and more women are entering pregnancy with chronic conditions such as hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. The rising number of cesarean sections, a major surgery that is not always necessary, is also believed to be a contributor maternal mortality in South Africa. The United States could actually learn a lot from South Africa in terms of the decrease of maternal mortality. Nationally, the ratio decreased from 105.9 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2019 to 88 in 2020, indicating that South Africa is experiencing a decrease in maternal mortality. The three leading causes of maternal deaths in South Africa are HIV-related infections, obstetric hemorrhage, and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, such as preeclampsia. Pre-existing medical conditions also account for a high proportion of pregnancy-related complications. Despite progress, 57% of all maternal deaths occur on the continent, giving Africa the highest maternal mortality ratio in the world. Many women who experience maternal death in Sub-Saharan Africa live in poverty and do not receive adequate care in time to address complications. Other contributing factors include high rates of child marriage and unintended pregnancies. As we can see from this map, Sierra Leone has the highest maternal mortality rate. And just like in the US, most deaths are still deemed as preventable. So what is reproductive justice? The issues of abortion access and maternal mortality fall under reproductive justice. The term combines reproductive rights and social justice. Reproductive justice encompasses reproductive health and reproductive rights, while also using an intersectional analysis to emphasize and address the social, political, and economic systemic inequalities that affect women's reproductive health and their ability to control their reproductive lives. It centralizes and liberates communities of color and dismantles systems of oppression and white supremacy. The reproductive justice movement came into its own in June 1994, when a group of mostly white women gathered at a conference in Chicago to hear about the Clinton administration's proposal for health care reform, which de-emphasized reproductive health, excuse me, reproductive health care in an attempt to head off Republican criticism. The few Black women that were present were concerned. There was little focus on health services like pre- and postnatal care, fibroid screenings, or sexually, sexually transmitted infection testing, and seemingly no understanding of how Black women's choices around parenthood and reproductive care were often constrained by things like income, housing, and the criminal justice system. So 12 Black women leaders, five of them which are pictured here, gathered in a hotel room to discuss how to address these disparities. The group called themselves the Women of African Descent 
for reproductive justice and bought full page ads in the Washington Post and Roll Call that featured over 800 signatures calling for any health care reform package to include the concerns of Black women. Three years later, 16 organizations, including Black, Asian American, Latina, and Indigenous women, got together to create Sister Song, a collective devoted to the reproductive and sexual health of women and gender non-conforming people of color based in Atlanta. So the core reproductive justice tenets um, include or state all women or those with the uterus have the right to have children, the right to not have children, and the right to nurture the children we have in a safe and healthy environment. One's reproductive right is a human right, which also includes civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. New categories of human rights include environmental, developmental, sexual, and digital rights. Additionally, there are special project protections for the rights of immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and migrant workers. So I have a call to action for you. Think about what you've learned either through this presentation, your time with Dr. Jacobs, and this critical health psychology class, and think about your own privilege and positionality. Where do you fit in when it comes to reproductive health and social justice? Are you a qualitative research? Do you like numbers and want to do more quantitative research? Um, do you enjoy working with babies and may want to be a birth worker as a doula or a midwife? Um, male, female, or gender nonconforming? Do you want to work in, as a housing specialist to help people gain more equity and equal rights to housing? Do you want to be an abortion doula? Do you have an interest in law and want to change laws and policies in reproductive health? There's so many ways um, and you can figure out where you fit in when it comes to reproductive health and social justice. What problem will you solve that is concerned with the distribution and impact of power differentials on health behavior systems and policies? These are just some job titles within the realm of reproductive justice to consider. We're waiting for your solutions. Lastly, if I have piqued your interest in reproductive justice and mental health, these books are great starting points. Reproductive Justice, this top left corner, an introduction co-written by Loretta Ross, one of the founders of the framework, provides a comprehensive yet succinct description of the field. Next to that, Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the, Me the Meaning of Liberty by Dorothy E. Roberts analyzes the reproductive rights of Black women in the United States throughout history. Uh, diagonal from that, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present by Harry A. Washington, traces the complex history of medical experimentation on Black Americans since the middle of the 18th century. More specifically, she talks about the so-called father of gynecology, James Marion Sims, and how he built his career off the bodies of enslaved Black, black women, um, Anarcha, Lucy, and Betsy. And then next to that, This Isn't What I Expected, Overcoming Postpartum Depression by Karen Kleiman is a guide to self-help and professional treatment of postpartum depression. And of course, I'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions, comments, and challenges for inquiry, this is how you can reach me. I look forward to hearing from you and thank you for your time.